Dr. Sarah Brown, um, who is the Chair of English and Literature Faculty at Signum University, where she has taught on courses with Corey Olson, Verlin Flieger, Dimitra Femi, whoop, um, Robin Reed, sorry, she's my supervisor, uh, Doug Anderson, Amy Sturgis, and John Garth. Uh, Sarah currently serves on the editorial board of Malorn, uh, the Journal of the Tolkien Society, and is co-presenter on podcasts such as uh, The Tolkien Experience, The Rings of Power Wrap-Up, and The Prancing Pony. Her essay on the alchemic reading of The Ring of Power won the Tolkien Society Award for Best Article in 2023, and she is currently working on a number, and I mean a number, of other projects for publication. I look forward to the 10 monographs. Because who needs sleep, right? I hear it's a social construct. Like we can, we can push through. Uh, so yes, a massive welcome to Sarah, over to you. Thanks Will and thanks for inviting me today. So varied perceptions of Galadriel occur both within Middle-earth and outside of it in Tolkien scholarship. In many ways, she is a liminal figure on the threshold between Middle Earth and Valinor and between secular and sacred influences from the primary world that Tolkien lived in and drew upon. As Jane Beale observes, Galadriel has been compared to a fallen angel, a Valkyrie, Morgan le Fay, and various Celtic goddesses, as well as H. Ryder Haggard's she. And Christine Larson remarks that Galadriel could be seen variously as a witch, a bitch, a heroine, or a demigoddess. Loved that quote, by the way. Even Tolkien could not pin her down. Having discovered Galadriel in Lothlorien, he then had to create a backstory for this enigmatic character so that her presence and power in Middle-earth made sense within his world. And this he did, but he changed his mind at various points in his life as to who and what she was. So although he did not attempt to dissuade Father Robert Murray, for, for example, from drawing parallels with Galadriel and Mary in Letter 142, we should always bear in mind the intended recipient of his letters, as this does have an effect on both tone and content of the response. For the majority of the time, Tolkien thought of Galadriel as a penitent, one who had fallen and must be redeemed, as he informs us in Letter 320, written in 1971. But by Letter 353, written in 1973, Tolkien had decided that she was, quote, unstained. She had committed no evil deeds. Her reasons for desiring to go to Middle Earth were legitimate, and she would have been permitted to depart, but for the misfortune that before she set out, the revolt of Feanor broke out. Misfortune. For his own reasons, then, Tolkien felt late in life that he should rewrite Galadriel to absolve her of any wrongdoing, a move that would have totally changed her backstory. And one thing we should be able to agree on, though, is that Galadriel is portrayed as one of the most beautiful of all the elves. That sounds like a completely uncontroversial statement, right? Until we encounter what many of the romantics of the 18th and 19th centuries thought about beauty. Edmund Burke's A Philosophical Inquiry into the Origin of Our Ideas of the Sublime and Beautiful is a foundational text in aesthetic theory in which his exploration of aesthetics focuses on distinguishing the concepts of the sublime and the beautiful and understanding the emotional responses they evoke. Burke's inquiry delves into the psychological and physiological responses to both beauty and the sublime. And he suggests that the sublime triggers a heightened state of awareness and emotional intensity, often linked to the instinct for self-preservation. Beauty, on the other hand, induces a sense of relaxation and pleasure, often associated with the instinct for social connection and procreation. So according to Burke, the origins of beauty and the sublime lie in their causal structures. Beauty's formal cause is the passion of love, whereas the formal cause of the sublime is the passion of fear, especially of death. The thrill of the sublime, which raises tension and excites awe, is contrasted with the more reassuring experience of the beautiful, which offers a release of tension and inspires us, quote, with sentiments of tenderness and affection. The experience of the sublime is linked to feelings of wonder, reverence, and often fear. It's powerful and overwhelming, associated with vastness, obscurity, and magnificence. 
Burke reinforces his point by describing sources of the sublime as, quote, whatever is fitted in any sort to excite the ideas of pain and danger, that is to say, whatever is in any sort terrible. For Burke, the sublime and the beautiful were not only completely different from one another, each was aligned with one gender rather than another. To the feminine belonged the beautiful, with all its softness and warmth. To the masculine belonged the sublime, with all its power and majesty. But Burke was not the only one to think of these concepts in gendered terms. We see Thomas de Quincey arguing in 1838 that, quote, it is a great thought, a true thought, that the sublime, in contraposition to the beautiful, grew up on the basis of sexual distinctions, the sublime corresponding to the male and the beautiful, its antipole, corresponding to the female. In Observations on the Feeling of the Beautiful and the Sublime, Immanuel Kant believes that a woman's, quote, figure in general is finer, her features more delicate and gentler, and her mien more engaging and more expressive of friendliness, pleasantry and kindness than in the male sex, and chiefly result in making her known by the mark of the beautiful. He follows this statement with the declaration that Women have a strong inborn feeling for all that is beautiful, elegant and decorated. Even in childhood, they like to be dressed up and take pleasure when they are adorned. Anyone feeling nauseous yet? For Kant, the beautiful involves a sense of harmony, order and pleasure derived from the form and design of objects that have symmetry, proportion, harmony. In contrast, the sublime involves a mix of awe, admiration and fear inspired by the vastness or power of objects or ideas. The sublime evokes what Kant calls negative pleasure or a sense of pleasure mixed with discomfort arising from the mind's struggle to comprehend something vast or powerful that surpasses ordinary limits. These descriptions can be interpreted as reflecting 18th century European gender norms. As Christina Fjongestam points out, quote, a wide variety of fields of knowledge were gender coded in the 18th century. Defining beauty in traditionally feminine terms and portraying it as less intense and impactful than the sublime does subordinate the feminine. The sublime linked to masculine power is depicted as more significant, more pronoun, profound. Quote, within the oppositional duality of beauty and sublimity, Nicola Trott tells us, the sublime is a privileged term due to its suggestions of masculine strength, vigor and greatness, as opposed to the feminine delicacy and diminutiveness that define the beautiful. Burke's gendered response makes the case that all that is beautiful must necessarily be feminine and evoke a warm, gentle, comforting response to something that feels familiar and unthreatening. Beauty, he argues, induces a sense of relaxation and pleasure, often associated with the instinct for social connection. To men are ascribed opposite merits strength, fortitude, power, determination, emotions we associate with masculine type figures such as God, kings and fathers that engender respect, awe and submission in fear. Instead of warm familiarity, the sensation is that of cold distance as the sublime triggers a heightened state of awareness and emotional intensity, often linked to the instinct for self-preservation. In The Feminine Sublime, Barbara Freeman shows that theoretical concepts of the sublime and the beautiful being based on an opposition of conventional male and female traits holds particularly true for Burke's aesthetic theory, which rests, she says, upon an understanding of sexual difference. This is totally clear in a section where Burke says that to do other than this would be, quote, a confusion of ideas or abuse of words. Thus, by confounding the beautiful and sublime with gender stereotypes, Burke establishes a hierarchy between these ideas, mirroring the privileged male position in 18th century Britain. Beyond the aesthetic and ethical viewpoints, there's also a political perspective. Freeman examines the power dynamics of the sublime in relation to its misogynist and xenophobic aspects, showing how Burke's conceptions of the bad sublime are the politically provocative defined in female terms. This becomes really clear in his pamphlet, Reflections on the Revolution in France, in which he defines the power of the uprising as having an inferior sublimity, characterized by what he describes as, quote, all the unutterable abominations of the furies of hell in the abused shape of the vilest of women. 
Well, this, of course, for him cannot be true sublimity. For Burke, that belongs solely to the male gender and not to those who simply demonstrate masculinity in terms of their behavior. How dare they? Burke highlights the sublime nature of power, suggesting that women's lack of power is particularly enjoyable for the male heterosexual observer, that is. And he declares that, quote, beauty in distress is much the most affecting beauty. And of course, if beauty is in distress, it is the sublime power of men that will come to their rescue. As Burke goes on to say, quote, we submit to what we admire, but we love what submits to us. Thus framing his gendered concepts of the sublime and the beautiful within the imbalance in society's gender power dynamic. He illustrates this with a treatise on the difference in perception between the maternal and the paternal figure. And this shows an awareness that masculinity is not necessarily tied to the male body, which he acknowledges is capable of femininity, but it's notable that he sees that as a weakness. There is no question that Burke had particular ideas about gender hierarchy or that he embraced a gendered semiotic code that organizes the human passions and our response to objects around binary poles of human experience, the feminine beautiful and the masculine sublime. For some more proof, we need only to return to reflections on the revolution in France, in which he declares, quote, a king is but a man, a queen is but a woman, a woman is but an animal, and an animal not of the highest order. I don't think I would have liked Burke. Hmm. This demonstrates the position of women as the boundary of the symbolic order, particularly within political spaces. Now, I do not intend to spend all my time just countering the Burke's gender essentialism. I could be here all day for that, or the problematic nature of his gendering of the sublime and the beautiful. But what I hope this introduction to the gendered reading of the sublime and the beautiful will offer is a context for my counter reading of those two romantic concepts as applied to the rather ambiguous character of Galadriel, who is most commonly called Lady Galadriel, a title that implies her nobility and the respect of men and elves. Yet she's also suspected by some men and dwarves of possessing magical powers that are threatening to them. Boromir of Gondor is hesitant to enter her wood, which he deems a, quote, perilous land from which, quote, none escape unscathed. Eomer initially classes her with, quote, net weavers and sorcerers, offending Gimli when they first meet. And Wormtongue calls her, quote, the sorceress of the golden wood, an unfriendly epithet at best. Everything in Tolkien's depiction of and writings about Galadriel demonstrate a balance between femininities and masculinities. Galadriel's name translates to maiden crowned with a radiant garland. Her power, though, is undeniable. The appendix to the Lord of the Rings tells us that after the fall of Sauron, Celeborn leads the people of Lorien on an assault against Dol Guldur. And when they were successful, quote, Galadriel threw down its walls and laid bare its pits. The Unfinished Tales tells us that, quote, she was proud, strong and self-willed. She had dreams of far lands and dominions that might be her own to order as she would without tutelage. She has a, quote, commanding stature, is, quote, brilliant in mind and swift in action, and is perceived by Sauron to be his, quote, chief adversary and obstacle. Galadriel is both powerful and formidable. In her youth, she defies the Valar in leaving Valinor, for she, quote, yearned to see the wide unguarded lands and to rule there a realm at her own will. As Edith Crow observes, quote, the Galadriel that we see in the Lord of the Rings is clearly a great power, but in that work, we see only the tip of the iceberg. All these qualities resonate with what both Burke and Kant and others would have labeled the sublime powerful, and magnificent, exciting awe. At the same time, though, Galadriel also embodies the Burkean ideal of the beautiful, with her golden hair, her graceful presence, her serene demeanor. She provides comfort, guidance, and gifts to aid the fellowship in their journey, reinforcing the sense of beauty associated with grace and benevolence. Lothlorien is a place of peace and harmony, mirroring the classic qualities of beauty in its symmetry, light, and tranquility. 
her voice is often described as gentle. Frodo perceives her as fair. And though called Nerwen, man-maiden, by her mother, and Artanis, noblewoman, by her father, the name she chose to be her Sindarin name was Galadriel, quote, for it was the most beautiful of her names and had been given to her by her lover, Teleporno of the Teleri. I wanted to get Teleporno in there. Whom she wedded later in Beleriand. A significant aspect of Galadriel's beauty lies within her hair, which combines the light of both Laurelin and Telperion, and is so beautiful that Feanor asks three times for a strand of it. Feanor, no. Her hair, we are told, quote, surpasses the gold of the earth and, quote, the light of the two trees, Laurelin and Telperion, had been snared in her tresses. Even in a reading of the beauty of Galadriel's hair, though, we can see that there is a potential challenge to Burke's rigid gender division between the beautiful and the sublime. In her essay, Beautiful and Terrible, The Significance of Galadriel's Hair in the Lord of the Rings and Unfinished Tales, Lillian Darvell draws a fascinating comparison with the infamous figure of Lilith from Goethe's Faust, in which the closing couplet is, quote, thy spell threw him and left his straight neck, straight neck bent and round his heart one strangling golden hair. If we combine that observation with the complicated understanding of Galadriel amongst the various mortals in Middle-earth, we may recognize what Elizabeth Gitter is aiming for when she speaks of a golden seductress whose, quote, gleaming hair was a weapon, web, or trap. Eomer's words to Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli upon hearing that they have come from Lothlorien resonate with this description, as he says, quote, few escape her nets. But if you have her favor, then you also are net weavers and sorcerers, maybe. Gitter's essay explores the ways that hair, especially golden hair, functions as a text in itself with rich symbolic value, signifying the strangling and entrapping of the male in a, quote, glittering snare, web or noose. Long hair, says Penny Howell Jolly, suggests danger and sexuality. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow cautioned, quote, often treachery lies underneath the fairest hair. Indeed, a prevailing image of long, particularly blonde hair involves nets or webs with an implication of their entrapping or binding the unwary as a sign of the danger of the sexual woman. There are many other examples in literary history of this potential feminine peril. Shakespeare's Bassanio in The Merchant of Venice imagines that Portia's hair could be, quote, a golden mesh to entrap the hearts of men faster than gnats in cobwebs. The 14th century poet Petrarch warns that, quote, amid the locks of gold, love hid the noose with which he bound me. The famous Lorelei from German literature was a siren with long golden tresses whose music seduced sailors and led them to their deaths in the Rhine. So it is fascinating to note that one of the ways in which Galadriel is considered beautiful is due to her hair, which cultural history tells us can also be an indicator of danger, an element, as we have learned, of the sublime rather than the beautiful. However, asking whether Galadriel is beautiful or sublime is like asking, is she perilous or is she fair? And the answer, of course, is yes. The figure of Galadriel intermixes the masculine and the feminine not by denigrating or limiting the passion of love associated with the beautiful, but by interweaving the passion of fear that signifies the sublime, thus rejecting a Burkean reading of beauty as inferior or somehow subordinate to the sublime. By projecting a beauty that has its own power, those who encounter Galadriel are rendered deeply receptive to her splendor. In appraising Kant's account of the sublime, Timothy Costello notes that, quote, Kant's language reflects the confusing, disorienting, even disturbing quality of the experience. All expressions of fear, anxiety, suffering, and loss. So how does this connect to the experience of being in Galadriel's presence? As Christopher Vaccaro observes, Galadriel takes on a sublime quality to the hobbits, such as when Sam tells Faramir, quote, you could dash yourself to pieces on her or drown yourself like a hobbit in a river, but neither rock nor river would be to blame. Vaccaro posits that Galadriel's associations with nature are numerous and Sam praises her in a manner fitting a nature goddess. 
But this description from Sam reveals more than an association with nature. Noting that Tolkien also describes her as, quote, the mightiest and fairest of all the elves that remained in Middle-earth, or that, quote, her voice was clear and musical, but deeper than woman's want. We are meant to understand that this is not a simple vision of beauty as Burke envisaged. In Galadriel, we are offered a balance between soft and hard, warm and cold, feminine and masculine, beauty and the sublime that was not anticipated by Burke and his ilk. Beautiful she may be, but Frodo sees her as, quote, seeming now tall beyond measurement and beautiful beyond enduring, terrible and worshipful. Tall and white and fair, she appears in Lothlorien, but she also, quote, shone like a window of glass upon a fair, far hill in the westering sun, or as a remote lake seen from a mountain, a crystal fallen in the lap of the land. It may have seemed to Gimli that he looked suddenly into the heart of an enemy and saw their love and understanding, but for Sam the experience was difficult, as he says, quote, I felt as if I hadn't got nothing on and I didn't like it. Aragorn may tell Boromir that, quote, there is in her and in this land no evil unless a man bring it hither himself, then let him beware. But in Book 2, Chapter 6, Lothlorien is described as perilous four times on one page. Who is a stranger, Burke asks, to that manner of expression of being softened, relaxed, enervated, dissolved, melted away by pleasure? But Galadriel defies any attempt to contain her within such a glass cage, as her beauty is enervated by a sublimity that inspires Burkean higher passions of awe. In her lies the potential to become that terrible and beautiful queen who would rule Middle-earth mercilessly, quote, beautiful and terrible as the morning and the night. The passion of love that Galadriel excites in Gimli is not warm and comforting, but perilous and difficult, mired in grief. Galadriel's sublimity is of a quality far beyond what Burke could perceive, focused he, as he was on tangible objects rather than the peril of fairy. The combination of masculinities and femininities, the beautiful and the sublime, the perilous and the fair within Galadriel, resists a simple categorization. As a result, those who encounter her are filled with both joy and awe. Encoding the feminine as beautiful rather than the sublime renders it safe and non-threatening. I would argue, therefore, that Burke's treatise on the sublime and the beautiful is not just an exploration of these foundational concepts of the Romantic movement. Inadvertently, though it may have been, his work is also a political text in which the feminine is subjugated and relegated to a position of submission in juxtaposition with the masculine. The, quote, severe inconsistencies referred to by Christopher Tolkien in the introduction to the section, The History of Galadriel and Celeborn in the Unfinished Tales, lend themselves to the ambiguous nature of Galadriel's presentation as a character. Instead of frustrating a desire for an unequivocal portrayal that might render her more flattened and less interesting, this offers instead an opportunity for the reader who seeks out the borderlines and boundaries in a text who finds in the liminal, the complex and the uncertain, an intriguing challenge that invites inquiry into the spaces between and beyond the known and the unknown, as well as the exploration of the nature of being and becoming, the fluidity of identity and the dynamics of change and continuity. Thank you. Sublime. Lol. <laughs> Thank you so much for uh, starting off our second section here with such uh, a passionately delivered and really thoroughly uh, explored topic. I loved how um, it wasn't just Burke that you were drawing on, but like Kant as well, who mm -hmm. had, uh, through Coleridge and some of the other romantics, actually had such a massive influence uh, on British culture and aesthetics. So yeah, thank you. Great. Uh, okay, we've got a lot of questions in the room. I'm uh -oh. going to go to Christian, who hasn't had a chance yet. Thanks. And thanks, Sarah. You will not be surprised to hear that I'm absolutely, or as always. Um, thanks, Christian. Well, <laughs> there is a question coming, don't worry. Um, <laughs> in in the chapters in Lothlorien, um, the Fellowship on their quest are arguably the safest they've ever been, physically at least. Mm -hmm. And yet, when they are there, there's always the talk about 
oh, we've been searched, we've been tested, we've been almost violated psychologically, if you mm. will. Um, and I've always wondered about that sort of juxtaposition there. And it seems to come very much from Galadriel, obviously, who is mm -hmm. the queen of the land. I was wondering what you make of that, well, the juxtaposition in light of what you've just um, so enlighteningly um, told us about. I think the word safe is doing a lot of heavy lifting in that sentence, actually, um, because they are safe in the sense that the power of Galadriel keeps the orcs away, right? Um, and so they're not under attack from those physical forces. But as you've noted, they are actually, uh, we could use the phrase under attack from Galadriel's mind and the way in which she invades their minds. Um, and I think that speaks to what Aragorn says, that it's not perilous unless you bring your own peril in with you. Um, I mean, poor Sam's response was that he felt like he was naked and he didn't like it at all. And one wonders what peril he brought in with him. Um, but yeah, they are safe, but, you know, she's perilous and fair. So they are safe in the sense that they're not going to die anytime soon um, and they are under the protection of the elves, but they're not going to be safe from Galadriel seeking to find out what she wants to find out and at the same time making them confront their own fears, their own concerns and anxieties, because that's terrifying, actually. Um, we wonder what images she put in Boromir's mind, for example. To answer your question. Uh, Mercury, then Andy, sorry. Uh, I'm going to echo Christian. That was great. Thank you so much. Um, Thanks, you've got me thinking about, I would love your opinion on this. Um, we, we were discussing it sometime previous to this about how Burke's idea of beautiful really seems to be focused on the delicate and pretty mm -hmm. as opposed to anything else. And you've made me think about how Tolkien was so against fairies being seen as delicate and pretty. Mm -hmm. And he was much more focused on them being sublime. And I wonder if you have any thoughts about that. Oh, I completely agree. Yeah. Um, because, of course, his... Um, reading of that was all to do with a reading of fairy um, that presents it as being a perilous realm. There is nothing safe about fairy, but it is beautiful. Um, I mean, if you read Smith of Wooden Major, you know how he was drawn into fairy. He wanted to be there. He missed it when he wasn't there, but it wasn't safe for him to be there all the time. And there had to come a time when he gave up the ability to visit fairy because you can only do that for so long. Um, and you also can't go there without being utterly changed. So, yeah, I completely agree with you. Um, Burke's idea of the beautiful had to do with the, the kind of diminutive and the pretty and the lovely that Tolkien really didn't go for at all. We know what his thoughts on the Victorian fairies were. Um, so you, once you start to invoke fairy, then you're completely moving away from the sense of the beautiful just being the lovely, lilting and pretty. Sarah, that was awesome. It was a fantastic Andy. paper. No, it was. It was brilliant. And I, you, and you, you got me thinking about, and that name has always puzzled me, the one that, in the Narwen, you know, the one about... Narwen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm wondering, is Tolkien using his language invention and his invention of names to encode in that name some of the things that you just explored about oh, yeah. that mixing? Oh, yeah. Oh, I mean, Tolkien never did anything language wise by accident. No. No, no matter how much he argued that Farmer Maggot's name was because he just liked the sound of it. That's a whole other paper that will be coming. Um, yeah, definitely. Because he, he from the very beginning, he presents Galadriel. Well, from the very beginning, let's remember, he encounters her in Lothlorien and then has to do the whole backstory thing. But from the very beginning, um, we see her as powerful, as strong, as determined, um, and as beautiful. She's stunningly beautiful in all of the ways in which he describes her. And alongside that, he always puts this sense of power and magnificence. So the idea that her name given to her by her mother, by her mother. which I think is important, uh, of Nerwen, that she is man-maiden, is this idea of this blending of masculinities and femininities um, that show that Gladriel has the capacity to demonstrate both at the same time, um, which is just magnificent, really, isn't it? Yeah, brilliant. 